The race to 5G is on, and the battle for talent is getting fierce. Welcome to 5G Talent Talk with Kerry Charles, a podcast dedicated to helping you face the future workforce head on. Navigate this challenging talent landscape with innovative strategies to attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work. Only here on 5G Talent Talk with Kerry Charles, CEO of Broadstaff Talent Solutions. Hi, I'm Kerry Charles. Thank you so much for being with me today on this episode of 5G Talent Talk. And I am very excited to have with me digital influencer, and infrastructure visionary, Mark Ganzi. Mark is the CEO of Digital Colony and CEO-elect of Colony Capital. He is also the founder and CEO of Digital Bridge Holdings, a leading global investor and owner of mobile and internet infrastructure. Mark, thanks so much for being on, with, on the show with me today. Thanks, Karen. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for the invitation. So, Mark, I'm dying to hear your journey in digital infrastructure. How did you get to where you are today and what has been your path to such incredible success? Well, it's, I think, Carrie, it's like all of us. None of us went to school for digital infrastructure, right? Um, I feel a little bit sometimes like the accidental tourist and other times I feel incredibly lucky because the way I got into the industry was probably like most of us. We were invited by somebody to be a part of the industry and to, uh, and to take a chance. You know, my journey started in uh, 1993. I graduated from Wharton and was working at a REIT, um, buying distressed real estate from the uh, Resolution Trust Corporation. And when I got to this REIT, um, we had a number of these antenna leases keep popping up on some of the buildings that we had acquired. And everyone at the firm said, let's give the antenna leases to the young Wharton guy. He'll probably have an idea what to do with them because Nobody at that time understood what a, a cellular antenna was or a paging antenna or a broadcasting antenna. And so magically all the antenna leases ended up showing up on my desk. And I reached out to a lawyer friend of mine and I asked, what is cellular communications? And he said, well, you're in luck. I have a client who is actually in the cellular telephone business. You should meet them. And that was when I met Alex Gelman and Jeff Ginsburg. And so in 1994, after talking to them and them giving me some advice on antennas, uh, the three of us came together to build our first tower company, Apex Site Management. And uh, I'll never forget the day I went into the CEO's office at the REIT that I was working for, and he knew that I was meeting with them to talk about ways to help us with antennas. And he said, well, how'd the meeting go? I said, well, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, the good news is um, this is a great opportunity. We're going to make lots of money on antennas, and there's an awesome opportunity for you to invest. He said, wait a second, invest in what? I said, well, here's the bad news. I'm leaving, and I'm going to go join them, and we're going to go build a company. And that started my journey. It was purely by accident, by having someone flip an antenna lease on my desk. And you know, from there, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I had the uh, opportunity to work with Jeff and Alex for many years. We, we built a great business in Apex, merged it in a Spectra site, uh, started a business called Eureka Networks in 97, wiring up uh, fiber into office buildings, decided to leave Spectra site and go to Deutsche Bank for a couple of years to learn private equity and learn how to invest. And then got, got back into the tower business again in 03, picking up the pieces of the dot-com crash with uh, Global Tower Partners. We ultimately sold Global Tower Partners actually uh, two times before we sold it to American Tower. So we recapitalized the business from Great Hill to Blackstone, Blackstone to Macquarie, Macquarie to Dutch Pension Fund, PGGM, and then ultimately selling it to American Tower. And in 2013, I'll never forget that day, it was the first time I was unemployed since 2003. We, we had the closing with American Tower, and I was the only one asked not to stay on, which was something we, we had agreed to with American Tower. They said, you, you, you probably don't want to stay here uh, with us. But a great, profound respect for those guys and made the decision 24 hours later to sign an office lease and start a digital bridge because I really felt like, Carrie, our work wasn't done. And so I decided to create an investment management platform to continue to invest in great entrepreneurs and great businesses and bring my sort of 20 plus years of experience in building companies to help other entrepreneurs and CEOs build, build businesses and candidly do what I do best, which is go out and raise capital and uh, help these guys think about their business plans. And, and here we are seven years into that journey. We have 15 companies around the world. We manage 21 billion of assets at Digital Colony, which is now the, the official name of the digital platform inside of Colony. And uh, you know we're poised to double the size of that portfolio over the next three years. We think we'll get to about 42 to 44 billion of assets over the next uh, 24 to 36 months. So 
there's no end in sight for digital infrastructure, digital real estate. It's a, an exciting time in our sector. I think while the world is facing a lot of challenges in COVID and, and some, of the, some of the issues that we're facing here at home with, um, with just sort of racial equality and, and, and how we treat people, uh, one of the things that has been the connective tissue that sort of held it together is digital. Uh, it's kind of interesting. In this m massive moment of dislocation and, and civil unrest, we, 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 we have a business that's incredibly resilient and incredibly important. Digital tools are continuing to enable our economy uh, and to enable us to continue to go to work. It's enabling you and I to have this conversation and share it with the world. And so whilst we have a lot of turbulence out there, we also have a lot of excitement um, and a lot of purpose and a lot of vision to what we're doing right now. It's, uh, it's an interesting juxtaposition. You know, Mark, it sounds like you, part of your success has been your passion behind what you're doing, because I just, I just heard so much passion in your voice. Is that true? Yeah, listen, you know, if um, one of my great questions whenever I interview somebody is, uh, if you ever sent a candidate to me and you said, well, how was that interview with Mark Anzi? They'll say, well, it was great until the end. He asked this very strange question. And he, he'll always finish interview by saying, what are you passionate about? <laughs> and I'll preface that comment always by telling a candidate who wants to be my partner and work side by side with me, not work for me, work with me, mm -hmm. is um, that I want to understand what makes them tick. And for me, you have to have passion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't want to hear that, my, oh, my passion is doing models till 4 a.m. You know, that, that's not passion. That's working yourself into a, you know, into a bad spot. I want to know what emotionally makes somebody tick. I want to understand how they wake up. I want to understand how their feet touch the floor. And, you know, and, and whether they want to get up and compete, because that's an innate mm -hmm. quality in, in a human being, is the ability to want to get up and get after it and get in the fight and, and be a part of it. And then look, when, when the day ends, close your laptop, you know, turn <laughs> off your smartphone, do something that makes you passionate, whether it's, um, whether it's getting on your bike uh, or whether it's, you know, uh, giving time to your charity, uh, spending time with your kids, uh, going paddle boarding, wh whatever it is you do, find that passion because you have to have balance. If you don't have balance, um, really, then what are we here for, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of, the, part of the journey is about your spirit, and it's about your desire to want to improve yourself, and it's your desire to want to make a difference. Those seem like very simple and, and perhaps almost a little cheesy, but it, <laughs> to me, that's unlocking somebody's soul and understanding their innate qualities uh, as a human being and as a competitor. Um, those are things that are inherently uh, important to me when I'm, when I'm building teams. Well, well said, Mark, and, and I agree. Can you give me an overview of Digital Colony, uh, verticals, assets, and your role in 5G? Well, it's interesting. You know, today, we um, Digital Colony is, is 77 professionals globally operating from Singapore to London, uh, Boca, um, New York City, Los Angeles. Um, we operate a global investment management business where we're solely focused on the proliferation of 5G and how we build and enable uh, all of the technology that will go through uh, through those pipes and, and, and how we enable economies going forward. So it's pretty exciting. And, and, and the business itself has, has kind of three different strategies that we focus on. One, obviously, our biggest franchise is equities, where we make an investment of equity into a company. And that's where you have those 15 companies. We also have a business called Digital Liquid. That's our uh, liquid strategy run by Bill Hughes. So we invest in public securities. We manage capital for sovereign wealth funds and insurance companies where we help devise a strategy for them where at any given time, uh, Carrie, we're looking at 400 different public companies and we're using our, uh, our toolkit and digital to help make those informed decisions and in investing in some of the best digital public companies in the world. The third vertical we're in is, is in credit, digital credit. We just formed a credit team last year. So there's okay. going to be inevitable situations where we can't write an equity check and we have the ability to put capital to work across the capital structure. And so whether it's junior debt, term loan B, mezzanine capital, um, being having the capability to play across the capital structure is so important because not, not everybody wants equity. And so when we're sitting with an entrepreneur and we're saying, okay, how can we really help your business? How can we fuel your business? And most importantly, how, how can we help you make returns? The, at the yeah. ultimate day, sometimes, you know, the right answer is for me to look a CEO in the eye and say, you don't need equity. You know, here's what you need. You, you need a, a slice of junior capital, and here's why it's going to help you, and mm -hmm. here's where you're going to get to the right turns, and this is how you're going to make money. Because, by the way, I've been in your chair. I sat there 10 years ago as a CEO, and somebody forced equity down my throat when I should have taken, you know, a junior piece, or I should have taken a convertible preferred note, 
there's other ways to finance digital businesses and it's not always through equity. So part of our job at Digital Colony is, is trying to help enable companies and help them try to not perhaps make some of the mistakes that I made in the past. So what is digital infrastructure really? Is it technology? Is it real estate? Well, it's a little bit of both. You know, the, 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 the expression that we always use, it's, it's really the pipes. It's the pipes and the plumbing that enable everything that is digital, whether it's content, applications, IoT, uh, distance learning, telemedicine, uh, online fitness, you know, all of the things that make up the mosaic of our lives today are enabled by, by digital. And so the question ultimately is how do we, you know, how do we transport that data? How do we manufacture that data? How do we store that data? Um, and how do we enable all of that ecosystem to happen? The way we do it is, is really through sort of four core verticals. Uh, the first and easiest for everyone to understand is towers. It's been a great gift to all of us for almost 30 years. Uh, great business, very easy to understand. Building macro sites, whether it's a tower or a rooftop site, that's been a great um, industry vertical for you and for me and for everybody that's uh, watching today. Second is fiber. So you've got two kinds of fiber. You've got wholesale fiber, enterprise fiber. Wholesale fiber is where we carry traffic for carriers. So we're in essence a carrier's carrier. So we're helping... Uh, transport traffic long distances, you know, from a data center to a switch or a switch to a central office, a central office to an interconnection point or a switch to a cell site. Um, so we provide that, that long haul and medium range capacity where we carry traffic for CenturyLink, AT&T, Verizon, um, Comcast, Time Warner, you name it, you know, we're, we're quote unquote uh, a carrier's carrier. Uh, then on the enterprise side, we're connecting businesses. Um, where you're providing that fiber connectivity, that range of bandwidth solutions. And so that's fiber. The third vertical is data centers. And um, data centers is a really a nuanced business today. A lot of people don't fully understand how to unpack it, Carrie, but there are four verticals in data centers. The easiest is, is totally real estate, which is hyperscale. Hyperscale are those big buildings. We own the land, we own the building, and we basically triple net lease it to an Amazon or a Microsoft. You know, 10-year leases, 12-year leases, long-term uh, leases with good investment grade tenants, low returns. Uh, the second piece is edge computing where, you know, we're enabling content and applications to push towards the edge of the network. So these mm -hmm. are data centers that, that data bank has, by example, where we are bringing together that, that marriage of mobility applications and content. And it's sort of a junction box where it meets and proliferates back out, you know, to mobile networks or to cable networks. And a lot of those facilities are being, they're not as big as hyperscale. They typically are you know, a 30,000, 80,000 square foot building. We own the land. We maybe have two to six megawatts of power. And we may have anywhere upwards of four to 500 customers in a, you know, in an edge data center. Because those are small nodes for folks like Facebook or Salesforce or Time Warner or Comcast or whatever it is. So th th that's an interesting business. It's growing quite fast. That has about double digit, 12 to 15% organic growth right now. Good, really good, solid business. The third vertical is co-location. That's like the old style data centers that you see which are built for enterprises. So whether it's um, uh, hosting KPMG's workloads or hosting uh, Sabre for American Airlines or, or hosting you know, workloads for a corporation or Akamai, or you know, this is just a place where you, you, you have your data safely stored and where you can run active applications. And typically those workloads are less than a quarter megawatt. They're smaller workloads. A customer will have four racks up to 50 racks and um, it's a rental model. You know, it's a co-location model, a lot like towers. And then the last piece of the data center space is um, what we call managed cloud. So that's a hybrid IT solution where we actually host the infrastructure for the customer. We do this at a company called Aptum up in Canada, very successful, good business, and provides a range of IT solutions from cybersecurity, private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, uh, you name it. It's a, it's a full arsenal of solutions for enterprise uh, you know, customers. Yeah. Last but not least is small sales. Um, a lot like towers, except flipped on its side, you know, fiber really sort of being the, the, the tower, so to speak, as it transports the signal out to a pole. We'll own the pole, we'll own the antenna. Many instances, we'll own the fiber, and we're backhauling or front hauling that capacity to a switch or to a, you know, or to a RAN location. Uh, we've got an incredible business in the U.S. called Extinet. Um, you know Jim Hyde and the team there are quite well. Uh, 30,000 nodes, uh, 20,000 miles of fiber. And uh, we, we either ma manage or own about 600 CRAN hubs today. So that's a good business. So those are the four, what I call the four basic food groups, um, <laughs> you know, towers, fiber, data centers, small cells.
that's the uh, that's the 5G digital infrastructure ecosystem. Okay, I see a book in your future called Digital Infrastructure for Dummies because that was so well explained. <laughs> I love you can it. you can ghostwrite it for me, Carrie. I'd be happy to sign the book. I love it. Um, so let's switch gears uh, to sure. COVID nineteen. Obviously, COVID nineteen has had a massive impact on everything and everyone globally. What are your thoughts on how COVID-19 will impact digital infrastructure, let's say in the next 12 months, the next five years, even the next 10 years? Look, I think it's, um, you know, it, it's hard to, to sort of really put into metrics what's going what, to what's gonna happen long range. I think we're all reacting to it in real time and we're seeing the implications of it on a short term basis. And look, I'll come back to the comment I made before. If you think about everything that's happening in our lives today, and how you conduct your life and how I conduct my life. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're both very active human beings. And so if you think about the, the, your ecosystem and what you do day to day, Carrie, you, you use e-commerce, you buy stuff online, I would assume. Uh, you probably have some sort of um, e-fitness type program, whether it's a Peloton or whatever it is, there's another impact. You're telecommuting now, you're sometimes working at home, you sometimes go to your office, right? You've yeah. got um, probably your company, uh, you guys probably use a cloud service, so you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're linking up to the cloud to grab applications, to grab your email, uh, to grab Outlook. Um, you've got virtual events like this. We're having a teleconference <laughs> right now, video conference, so right. you probably at some point shut your brain down and entertain yourself and watch some guilty pleasure show on Netflix, <laughs> I'm assuming. What, what is Have the you been following pleasure? me around all day? Oh, come on. I'm not, because you're basically like the rest of us, right? <laughs> right, and right. So, and then like, you know, I had a telemedicine appointment with my knee doctor in Vail, just trying to schedule, reschedule my, uh, I was doing a plasma injection, so I did telemedicine. And then I've got kids at home doing distance learning, probably like you do. And then I'm not on social media, but my kids certainly make up for me. But think about that for a second. I just gave you eight swim lanes of what happens in your house every day because of COVID. When we think about that and we look at the downward pressure on the infrastructure required to enable all of that, it's, it's mind boggling. And so you think about some of the metrics that came out in the first quarter, just to give you a couple things to think about. You know, Microsoft had a 382% increase in teams in the first quarter. That's wow. like incredible to understand. It'd be one thing to say, oh, we grew by 10%. They grew by 382% in the first quarter. You know, Facebook's messaging platform was up 50% in the first quarter. AT&T saw a spike of 52% growth in video traffic. Uh, Verizon saw a 49% increase in their VPN services. They saw 120% growth in their gaming platforms, right? Comcast had a 32% uptick in their upstreaming activities and 49% in downstreaming. Uh, VoIP and video conferencing was up 230% at Comcast. You know, Zoom, I can't even give you the metrics on yeah. Zoom. It's crazy to figure, we're on a Zoom call now. So Zoom, think about this for a second. December, 2019, Zoom was struggling and had 10 million users. Wow. Okay. Through the end of the first quarter, they had 200 million users. And the word is they're going to have 290 million users by the end of the second quarter. So 10 million users, 290 million users in a period of five months. It's incredible. I can go on and on. I, I mean, we're tracking all of our customers globally, Vodafone, Charter, you know, uh, Amazon. I mean, uh, everybody is experiencing massive downward pressure on the network. And at the end of the day, what that does for us as an industry is it creates opportunity. And when, when we were talking a, you know, a year ago about what we thought the total addressable market was for investment in 5G over the next five years, the metric I was throwing around at conferences last year, Carrie, I think you remember was $860 million. Right. Is the spend on 5G over the next five years. We just had that study refreshed uh, about 60 days ago. And our consultants came back and the new number is 1.15 trillion. So wow. you've, got a, you've got an incremental, you know, 200 billion in CapEx <laughs> that has been increased. And that's all because of COVID. And so you ask me, what's the short-term implication? What's the one-year implication? I'll give you the five-year implication. The five-year implication is, it's really simple. More fiber, more towers, more small cells, more CRAN hubs, more data centers, more jobs, right? More activity, more opportunity for everyone that's tuning into your uh, your incredible talent talks. So it, it should be it should be a good day for us. Now look, along that road, there's gonna be bumps, right? There's gonna be disruption of supply chain. There's gonna be disruption in the permitting process. There's disruption right. to our workforce. 
we're now being disrupted when we go to a street corner and install a node and there's a protest there, right? I mean, we're being thrown curveballs that we've never had as uh, developers of this infrastructure. So it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting moment in time for us as an industry. And so while there's huge opportunity, we also have this amazing responsibility to get it right and to make sure that we we deliver on the promise of of breaking down those divides and really right. setting the table to use digital as the ultimate weapon to bridging the digital divide, right? So right. it's a Mark. there is a social there's a social element to what we're doing that's very important. Right. Are we going to be able to build it fast enough as well, to no. meet the demand? I mean, what? How, how is yeah. this going to work? I think the short range is very challenged. Right. I think um, I think we as an industry wildly are underestimating the 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 impact of supply chain, and I think we're also wildly underestimating the ability of government to be able to react carefully, not only at a federal level creating policy. I mean, you've seen sort of the the struggles of getting the CBRS spectrum out there and. Some of the challenges that the chairman, you know, Chairman Pai has had with that. Um, I sit on, I sit on his board, his his broadband deployment board, and it, it's been hard. I mean, I think that we all want to move fast, but there are implications to moving fast. And I think then you have your struggles at the state levels, so as as you've seen at WIA, some of the, you know, some of the legislation battles we've seen, and then of course you see the battles that happen in our local communities that are literally street corner to street corner where we're fighting for building permits, easements. You know, changing you know c conditional use permits, uh, zoning board hearings. I mean, you know, when do you think a zoning board hearing is going to come back, right? Mm -hmm. You know, right. Zone, <laughs> we've seen virtual zoning. We've seen virtual zoning hearings now, where you there's a call like this, and oh city, really? The city council, and then you see people are able to you know zoom in uh, and and give commentary. And but so few cities are lined up to do that. So it's a it's a hard environment right now. It's challenging. Um, CEOs and and management teams in our industry are all struggling with the uh, the quote unquote the new normal. Right, right. Mark, what keeps you up at night? Um, well, I don't sleep that much, so <laughs> not, I don't really. So I'd say probably what keeps me up at night is is my work. I mean, it's 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 tiring. It's a uh, you know the last four to five months have been exhausting. Uh, we've been working seven days a week. The new norm is sort of fourteen hour days, sixteen hour days, and just keeping up with our customers has been has been hard. It's been a real challenge. Um, keeping my team focused, keeping them energized, you know, making sure that um, they're engaged and, and that we're providing the, the proper support. And I just don't mean IT support. I mean, mental support that we're all there for each other. And, you know, I've got a global call every morning where we bring our whole team together at 8 a.m., wake them up, Gansy on caffeine, let's go, let's go get it. <laughs> I have my infamous, uh, you know, evening calls with some of our senior leadership where they see a tequila in my hand and I'm on a cutting board cutting uh, getting ready to cook because I've been cooking every night, which has been a real blessing and a lot of fun. Look, you, you got to keep people connected. It's this is a hard environment. We, as much as digital keeps us connected, there's still a human element to what we do, right? And there's still a human aspect too. And and some people are struggling with this. Some people are having a yeah. hard time in this environment because they do feel disconnected. Some people love this. You know, they're right. really loving working from home and they say they're more productive and they're not sitting in their cars in traffic and. They're getting to spend time with their kids. And, and then some people are somewhere in the middle, which is they're sort of ready to come back to the office, but they're a little scared, they're a little apprehensive. And I don't think any of this keeps me up at night. I just think I have a, a singular purpose of just making sure that I maintain our, our culture and I keep our family together and, and that I protect my employees and that we, we continue to help and enable our customers. I think it's a challenging environment. We as CEOs are rewriting the rules of, of leadership right now. There's so many things uh, to leadership right now that are changing. You know, the things that we we have to do better as corporate America and as business leaders to, to create opportunity has never been more in sharper focus. Um, these are things that we started on, you know, close to seven years ago when we, we went down the road on ESG, which has a huge aspect of it around social and around governance and around um, making sure that the workforce is diverse and, and that we're creating opportunities and we're creating those opportunities equally and that we're putting people uh, reflective on our boards that there's, you know, that there's a great diversity in our boards and that, and that we don't forget that this country is about opportunity. And we, we as the business leaders have to lead because we're not gonna get it from the politicians. You can see that already. Right. Um, right. The rancor and the bickering that's happened in this country is just absolutely horrible. And so right. we as, as, as business leaders have to step it up. We gotta do a better job. And candidly, we're not even seeing it from our professional athletes who'd have an opportunity to bridge some of this divide. So, 
someone's got to lead. And, you know, I'm, I'm pushing very hard from my side to, to get other CEOs to stand up and to, and to take action. And we've taken action and we have a series of things that we're changing. And there were already things that were in flight that we're already doing that we're proud of. And, but the, the reality is we just have to do better. Um, I'm an optimist, as you know. So uh, these, are, these, are, these are interesting times and they're serious times. These are serious issues. And people just can't, you know, can't, you know, post a hashtag and think it's going to go away. That's not it. That's not what this is about. This is about whether or not you have the right moral compass and you understand what your responsibility is and that you understand how you can make a change in people's lives. You know, Mark, you had a meeting yesterday that actually, and I heard it was an optional discussion around the current social issues. What prompted that and how did that meeting go? Well, it's interesting. Um, what prompted it was one of my partners. Who's a you know comes from Haiti? He's had a an incredible journey. I mean, he's absolutely the American dream. I mean, the way he came over and his family came over uh, was in below poverty. They they figured out how to scratch you know literally uh, pennies and nickels and quarters to get to America. And his parents gave him an opportunity. And you know, as a as a as a black executive in, in corporate America, he's always felt that there are challenges that that didn't um, that people didn't understand or respect. And so. He wrote a passionate letter to everyone in the company, and I read it, and so did our chairman, Tom Barrick, and we, we, we felt very touched because he's, you know, I don't look at him as, I don't look at people as black or white or yellow. I, I just don't look that way. I look at him as he's my partner. He's Ramel. He runs a certain part of my business, and, and he's such a great guy, and, and his passionate plea really was, was, was more about how should we be thinking about this, and, and, and our policy around diversity is great. We have an amazing diverse workforce. A colony because Tom and I have made it a priority. And but we, we, he he said, look, we we need to have a dialogue. And you know this thing starts with people being honest with each other and opening their hearts and and giving everyone inside of your organization, whether you have four employees or whether like us you have 380 employees, it doesn't matter. You have to open the the doors and you have to create the opportunity for people to share their thoughts and views. So we created an optional you know town hall yesterday for two hours. You know, the first half an hour, sort of an, an all company meeting where we got to, Tom and I got to share our views and, and sort of open the dialogue. And then we, we broke the company up into about 15 different rooms, which you can do in Zoom. It's a great feature. Mm -hmm. So the company dispersed into 12 working groups. I think it was 12 or 15, I can't remember. But we had, you know, we had 160 employees engaged. You know, I was, wow. in, one of the breakout, I was in one of the breakout sessions and we all broke out for about 90 minutes just talking about the things that, that we can do to uh, enable the dialogue. But the most important thing is, you know, the dialogue's important. Mm -hmm. The action's even more important. More important, right. I'm, I'm all about the healing, I'm all about the dialogue, but we gotta go from here to here. Yeah. And that requires change. And change management is something that we can do in corporate America. And the hope is that if corporate America leads, maybe our politicians will get a clue and, and come behind us and, and follow as well. Mm -hmm. Because we need reforms. We need reforms around you know, how our law enforcement behave and, and how they treat people. And so there's a lot of work to do here. And on the corporate side, you know, I, I love the dialogue yesterday. It was, it was very open. It was very transparent. You know, we've, we've had a, a four corner approach to diversity. We're refining those policies right now in terms of how we can be a part of this. And, and most importantly, we've got to capture, we've got to capture people at a young age. And it's all about talent right. identification at a young age and giving everyone that, that equal footing where they say, I have a chance to see what corporate America looks like. I have a chance to apply to a college. I have a chance to get into a college and get a great education. And then when I'm there and I'm getting that great education, I have a chance to compete for a summer a fellowship at Colony Capital where I can be a part of that organization. And then we've gotta be recruiting and we've gotta recruit not just at, at Wharton or Stanford uh, or Yale, but there's other places that we, uh, can be recruiting as well. And so we're, we're, we're changing some of those policies and thinking about some of the other great higher learning institutions where we can uh, identify talent early, work with them early, and give them the chance to be a part of our family. And then last but not least, the fourth corner of our covenant to our employees and to our shareholders is, you know, continue to promote, continue to train, continue to remunerate carefully, continue, continue to incentivize, and continue to give the opportunity for people to have a path of growth in our organization. So it's high school, it's college, it's early hiring, and then it's retaining, incentivizing, and promoting great talent from within and creating that level playing field. Um, we're doing that and uh, I'm excited about it. 
Um, the early identification piece we're already doing. Uh, we've been doing that for a while. You know, Alex Gelman's been doing it with his Head Start program. We've done it at mm -hmm. Digital Bridge where we've got this vocation uh, program in Palm Beach County where we're working with young, young kids, young high school students that are in the inner city that are in tough places, giving them a chance to come into our office a couple hours a week to see what this looks like. We just gotta open people's eyes, right? You gotta, you gotta let them know that there's, that that invitation is equal, right? That's all you can do. All I can do is open a door, Carrie. I can't tell someone how to walk through it. Exactly. I can't tell them what to do when they get on the other side of that door. But if I've opened the door and I've enabled that opportunity, right. maybe they don't end up at Colony six years from now after they've graduated from University of Maryland or they've graduated from USC or they've graduated from Boulder, wherever they graduate from. But maybe, just maybe, we've changed someone's trajectory. Mm -hmm. And maybe that trajectory was headed for a bad place, which was no college. And perhaps it was headed towards crime or it was headed towards a low income job in fast food. But instead, we've taken that asteroid and we've shifted it off its path. Mm -hmm. and now it's aiming at higher education and it wants to be a doctor or it wants to be a civil engineer. Whatever their passion is, once again, it comes back to where this conversation started, which is where is your passion? Can I help unlock the soul of a young human and teach them that this is the best country in the world? And this is the best place where they're going to get the fairest shake because guess what? It is. If people don't want to live here and people don't want to be a part of America and not part of our democracy, I tell every person in Seattle that's sitting in that enclave, go live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Go try somewhere else, all right? right? And see how this works out for you. Right. But we all have to be in this dialogue together. We're all Americans. It's simple. Mm -hmm. This is what we are. For better, for worse, I believe for better, we have to make it a better place to be and a better place to live. Mark, I truly I'm hope running, other. I'm not running for office, by the way. <laughs> that was my that was my next thought. I'm like, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what's next for you later, and I'm hoping that you'll say running for office. But anyway, that's so. I want to talk just a bit about this skills gap, and I want to get your thoughts on it because there's been this this 5G skills gap that we're facing and you know it really hasn't changed much with the current economic landscape specifically what you talked about earlier because the need has actually increased do you have any ideas or thoughts or strategies on how to bridge this gap and build the workforce so we can make 5g a reality yeah well look this has been the challenge of our industry for a decade now when i was the the chairman of pcia now we uh, um and i hired jonathan adelstein the first thing i told him we had to do is we got to start training um, and so during my chairmanship, uh, that was a big initiative that we put into work. I mean, first hiring Alstein was a big part of that mission and, and, and upgrading our, our organization and, and putting more prominence in our organization. I think we achieved a lot of great things together, but we still haven't closed that talent gap. Right. And, and it's hard, you know, we've got to create these centers of excellence where we can get folks that have, you know, now gotten to 55, 60, 65, you know, where they've stopped working, but they have so much knowledge and that we've got to create a path where we can have some of our best engineers, some of our best business leaders, you know, some of our best asset managers. I mean, there's so many skills that go into what we do day to day. And you've, you've done such a great job of placing people into all these companies. And, and there's so many uh, amazing people that, that understand this challenge, you know, and, and we haven't done enough. I mean, that's the problem. There's not a university that goes out and teaches these skills. And the question is, should we be partnering with professional universities like Phoenix University and teaching a curriculum in digital infrastructure, RF engineering, civil engineering? Um, there's so many skill sets that happen, you know, data center engineering. Um, and so the engineering schools have produced the best talent. But guess what? When, when those kids come out of college, they have jobs. It's like this. Oh, yeah. Because civil engineering is at the, the all-time peak, but you, you can't go to school for an RF degree, right? Where do you go learn RF engineering? Well, you have to become a civil engineer to become an RF engineer. Mm -hmm. So this is some of the, the challenges that uh, we face as a sector. I've, I've talked to Jonathan about it. I've been long off that board. Um, but the, the burden, I think, probably sits with us as the employers. I mean, we've got to invest more into WIA. I think WIA needs to take a bigger leadership position in that. We need to be creating that curriculum. We need to have multiple centers of excellence. It just can't be one center of excellence. Like, for example, I know we had one in Aiken that was doing engineering for tower climbing. There was a whole school associated with that, right. um, which is a great, you know, state-funded program with the state of South Carolina. But there's other instances of that where we've got to amplify it and we've got to grow it. The challenge is this industry moves so fast that you don't have time to stop and say, okay, I'm going to take a year out of my really amazing job <laughs> and I'm going to go learn how to become a better RF engineer. 
Like, no, yeah. if the person's making 150, 160 thousand dollars a year, and they got to put food on the table. How can you expect them to stop and train? Right. So right. it's a real challenge, and and um, I think that um, we've got to figure out how to how to do that. And once again, a lot of that focus has to shift back to industry, back to our business leaders right. to try to help to try to help figure that out. So it's it's Tom Bartlett, you know, it's Jay Brown, it's Jeff Stoops, you know, it's Bill Stein at Digital Realty, it's Charles Smith at Equinix, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, it's all the 15 CEOs that run my companies. Um, and, and myself, I mean, we, we've all got to be a part of the challenge. You as well, mm -hmm. as somebody who goes out and hires. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that's some of my, my thinking around that for the time being. No, those are, those are excellent thoughts. Um, I want to touch on culture quickly because, you know, it's, it's just so important for business leaders today to, to have a strong company culture. And it's even more important now as employees are out there looking for jobs that, you know, they, the company has a strong culture. So in your opinion, what are the elements of a great company culture? And you mentioned diversity, definitely in my opinion, number one, diversity and inclusion, but what are some other elements? Well, I think, you know, just doing this for 26 years, I think the most important thing is respect. I think, you know, having good leaders in the C-suite that are real human beings and that, that employees can identify with and, and, and feel like that there's no, you know, ivory tower, you know, I've never been the ivory tower CEO. Uh, my partners like Alex and Jim Hyde and Surreal and and Dan Crusoe, they're they're humble guys. They just they understand where they started from, they understand where they came from. Their value construct is right. They understand the difference between what's right and what's wrong. And so it starts there. It starts at the top of having leaders that are, you know, that that have humility, that are transparent and that are willing to be transparent with their employees and 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 give respect and and give the opportunity to make decisions. And so a lot of our business leaders are all about delegating and giving people the power to make decisions, which is why our portfolio companies perform at a very high level from an organic growth rate, because we put the power in the hands of our employees to make the decisions and to ultimately execute for the customer. So trust, you got to have this great relationship of trust with your employees, because if you trust your employees, then they're going to trust working with the customer. Then the customer is going to see that confidence and that trust, and they're going to give trust back. And then that trust comes back to me in the, in, the, in the way of results. So respect and trust, transparency, these are just simple, simple codes of conduct in leadership. And then from a culture perspective, it's also about being very much active and involved in your communities. And this is something that all of our portfolio companies do. You know, Mexico Tower Partners was voted the best place to work in Mexico you know, five out of the last eight years by, by a, a big corporate survey that ENY runs. You know, Vertical Bridge was voted best place to work in South Florida two out of the last six years. Why? Because Bernard and Mike and Alex and Rot and Bob Page, they get culture, they understand it, but they're also big in their communities. They're present. And, and being present isn't just writing a check. You know, our, our, our thought process around, you know, community engagement and that cultural engagement is so important. And you've got to have that engagement because once the employees understand that it's more than just about making money and that it's about giving back in their communities and that we're giving the employees, not us, not the C-suite, but giving our employees the decision and the opportunity to make those calls about where they donate their time, hmm. where, we, where we donate our capital and, and having that level of engagement, uh, it's very gratifying to the soul. And we call that paycheck satisfaction, right? Hmm. Because it's not the dollar amount on the paycheck. It's right here. It's what's in your soul, and so I think those are some of the things that I've learned through the year. And and you know, it's um, that's it. You know, it's it's kind of a holistic right. approach to to management and culture. And you do those things right. They're so simple, right? They sound so right. easy. They sound so simple. <laughs> um, you know, and and we have a dialogue, right? You have to have this sort of 360 degree review with your employees, where you give everyone the chance to review you. You get the chance to review them, but it goes like this, and then it turns around and comes right back. And Having that 360 degree perspective around uh, and giving once again trust to people right. to allow them to sort of say, hey, I, I do like you, but here's what you could do better. And having that active dialogue and getting that feedback. I spent a lot of time listening to, to the people that work for me. Mm, and, it brilliant. My thinking, and it changes my thinking. My thinking is always very fluid. It's never rigid and it's always in change. Absolutely brilliant. Um, Mark, you are an extraordinary business leader and entrepreneur. If you could give one piece of advice 
to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps, what would it be? That's a hard one. Um, there's so many uh, lessons learned uh, around the uh, on the road. I'd say, look, the most important thing to be an entrepreneur is um, is team building, is the people you surround yourself with. And once you surround yourself with the right people, make sure that you remunerate them and you incent them and you treat them as equals. Uh, if you do that, you'll, you'll have a very long and successful business. And my, my history of doing this 26 years is I've shared uh, a lot of the pie with a lot of the people that have worked with me. Um, somebody once challenged me to think about the Gansey, uh, the Gansey digital family tree of like, what it would look like <laughs> from, from all the branches of all the leaders and CEOs that have come out of, uh, of my orbit. And it was a humbling experience. And, and I think that the great thing is I celebrate their successes. And if I've had the opportunity to give uh, the chance to make others believe they can be entrepreneurs, uh, I'm super humbled by that because um, I, I, I feel the same way. If they've had success, then the measure of success is really right here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been fun. It, and it's still a journey. I'm, I'm not, not that old yet. I still got that. You, you're just getting started. Okay. I've got more, <laughs> I've got more miles to run. <laughs> So what's on the horizon for a digital colony and what's next for Mark Gansey? Well, um, I've become a public CEO in two weeks. That ought to be interesting. Wow. Um, <laughs> something I've tried to avoid for the 30 years of my professional career or 28 years of my professional career. And so that'll be a new, that'll be a new challenge. It'll be a new journey, a new dialogue with customers and investors. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're in the middle of an exciting pivot. I'm, I'm changing a, you know, highly financially structured REIT into a digital REIT. Uh, mm. uh, it's a journey that started about a year ago. It's going to take two to three years to transform the company. So we're about a year into that journey. We got another year and a half to finish the transformation. My vision is perhaps bold. It's perhaps stupid. I don't know yet. I've been told a lot of my ideas are bold and stupid. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with it because my, my instincts tell me that it's the right thing to do. But um, look, uh, no one has built a global diversified digital REIT yet that is invested in the converged ecosystem. And, you know, this idea of convergence where the network elements are coming together to harmoniously produce a certain outcome is something that few people have really understood for the last couple of years. And I think as we've gone down this road together, Carrie, people are starting to understand my vision and understand this notion of convergence. And I think a lot of people for the last seven years haven't understood what I've built, but now it's starting to come into a sharper focus of what we have built, which is this incredibly um, big umbrella called Colony that happens to own some of the most unique businesses in the world. And okay. the uniqueness of it is our ability to deliver converged solutions. And so I was talking to an analyst today at Wells Fargo, and she asked me, what's unique and strategic about what you're doing today? I said, look, it's really simple. You know, 10 years ago, if I sat with Charlie Ergen at Dish, I'd have a, I'd, I'd a one-way conversation with him, which is, Charlie, how can I build towers for you? That's such a boring conversation. That's so 2000 and late. Like, now <laughs> the conversation is, how can I build you a low-cost 5G network where you have an open RAN architecture and you have the lowest cost per bandwidth of your competitors? Hmm. And how do you deliver applications and IoT and artificial intelligence? on a network that would be the envy of your competitors. And so it's that, that critical thinking of thinking now, how do I help a customer go from here to here? How can I be deeper in that customer relationship? The only way you can be deeper with a customer today is if you understand the entire journey. Hmm. And that entire journey revolves, you know, starting in an open RAN architecture in a data center, using fiber, proliferating out to a small cell or a tower, front hauling that network, bringing that back to an SDN location, which is an edge data center, where you have that intelligence from a Nokia or an Ericsson, or God forbid I say Huawei in another country where we do business, but, um, but understanding the entire playing field is where I'm going. And that ability to communicate with customers in a way that I've never been able to communicate with them, which is I can solve all of your dumb plumbing issues as we go forward. Let me be your dumb plumber and let me help you on, you know, let me help you deliver the entire range of solutions for your infrastructure and your real estate. And being a global solutions partner is, is where we're going. You know, uh, our chairman says it best, you know, you follow the logos, right? Tom mm -hmm. Burke hasn't spent a lot of time in digital infrastructure, but he's a fast learner. And if you follow the logos, right, and you stay close to your relationships and you're close to Vodafone and 
Telefonica and Facebook and Google and Amazon and Microsoft and AT&T and American Mobile Ace. And we can go on and on. We serve, right. we serve close to 55,000 customers at Colony now globally wow. in digital. It's incredible how many customers oh, we have around God. the world. But here's the vision. It's so simple. Where we're going is we want to be the only diversified digital read in the world that understands how to deliver a converged network. Hmm. Ambitious, bold, perhaps dumb, who knows, but that's the journey I'm going on. And uh, I'll be a lot more public now. I'm, I'm sort of going to be facing more of the yeah. public eye. That, that has a whole new set of challenges. I'm, I'm being told what to say and what not to say, but <laughs> at the same time, I'm still me. Uh, my instincts will always take over. Um, and look, I'm, I'm painfully transparent. So investors are just going to have to get used to that. A public CEO <laughs> who's painfully transparent. So maybe that doesn't work out so well. I don't know, but uh, not going to change who I am. Mark, I have no doubt in my mind that your vision will become a reality. No, no doubt. Your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on my show today. It has just been a blast. I truly appreciate it. Good luck to you and be well. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate the opportunity. Be well and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to another informative episode of 5G Talent Talk, brought to you by RCR Wireless News, Telecom Careers, and Broadstaff Talent Solutions. As we advance into the future, we promise to bring you the resources you need to navigate this ever-changing landscape of 5G to help you attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work. To access the show notes or leave a review, visit broadstaffglobal.com. Until next time.